And then I began to wonder, how long will it take us to build something like The Matrix, a game or a world that is so immersive that it was indistinguishable from physical reality? Hi, my name is Rizwan Verk. You can call me Riz, everyone does. And I'm the author of The Simulation Hypothesis. And today I'm going to talk about how video games influenced my ideas about physical reality and how some of these video games convinced me that we are actually living inside a computer simulation. When I was a kid, I used to play classic video games like Pac-Man, Space Invaders, but one of the first games I ever played was actually a text adventure game called Adventure. And you would basically type in these text commands and it would reveal different parts of the world. And then you had to draw the rooms yourself to try to make a map of the world. And so that introduced me to this idea that there could be an actual entire virtual world all contained within this code base. Later, there was a graphical version of Adventure for the Atari. And again, you had to go through all these different passages and there were Easter eggs and there were hidden components. And that really got me thinking whether there was a virtual world that was completely contained within this game and the extent of that world. Another game that I played back then that really got me thinking was a racing game called Pole Position. And you would have this race car and you would go around this track and there would be these bleachers with virtual people and then there would be like a mountain that looked like Mount Fuji off in the distance. And every time I played that game, I wondered what was beyond the mountain. Is there an actual world that I haven't explored yet? And what happens to those little characters when I turn off the game? Are they still around or not? Of course, now I know that they weren't around, but that really got me thinking about this idea that you could have an entire world within one of these games. As I grew older, one of the games that I spent the most time in was actually Second Life. And Second Life is not just a video game, it's a virtual world. And you have an avatar, the character that represents you in that virtual world, and you live a virtual life. And I found it interesting that people were having virtual jobs. They would go to their regular jobs during the day, and then later they would log in to Second Life, and they would have a job as a virtual bartender, for example, at a club or a hostess. And I always wondered, you know, why they would do that. Some people had entirely different relationships. You know, they were married to somebody in real life, and then they were married to somebody on the other side of the world in virtual life. And they would also have kids in some cases, <laughs> virtual kids. And so that really got me thinking about this idea, what is virtual is a reflection of what is real, and got me thinking about these questions of whether we're in a simulation or not. Years Years later, when I was in Silicon Valley and I had become a game designer, I sold my game company. We made mobile simulation games. And then I tried on a virtual reality game with a big, thick headset that was a table tennis or ping pong game. When I put this headset on, there was this opponent that appeared and I had a controller in my hand, but it looked like a paddle from my perspective. And it was so realistic in its responses. The physics engine was so good that I really felt like I was hitting a real ball and it was actually bouncing off of a real table. It was so realistic that for a moment, I completely forgot that I was only playing a virtual version of table tennis. So much so that I decided to put the paddle on the table and I decided to lean against the table, which is something I might do at the end of a real game of table tennis. Unfortunately, there was no table, so the controller fell to the floor. I almost fell over and then I began to wonder how long will it take us to build something like The Matrix, which would be a game or a world that is so immersive that it was indistinguishable from physical reality and it would be filled with AI characters or beings that are indistinguishable from so-called real people. I call that the simulation point, which is a kind of technological singularity. Once we get there, we'll be able to create these super realistic virtual worlds and we'll be able to lose ourselves within them, which leads to the question, have we already built these virtual worlds and are we already inside one of them and we just can't tell the difference? That is the essence of the simulation hypothesis. In my book, The Simulation Hypothesis, I lay out the 10 stages on the road to the simulation point. Those stages start with simple adventure and video games, and then they progress to virtual reality, to augmented reality, and to AI, which is where we are today. And then they also include brain-computer interfaces, like that which you see in The Matrix, where Neo and Morpheus were plugged into the simulation, if you will. And so when I first started working on the simulation hypothesis five years ago, I thought we were 50% of the way there. Today, with the rise of AI, including ChatGPT and many other 
AI characters and all of the video generation that we can do, I believe we're 70% of the way to getting to the simulation point, which means that it's 70% likely, in my opinion, that we are already inside a simulation. There's actually two different flavors of the simulation hypothesis. It's what I call the NPC versus the RPG version. NPC stands for non-player character or non-playable character, which means that everybody in the simulation is just AI. If you think of the Matrix, think of Agent Smith, for example, was an AI character. In the RPG version, there are players that exist outside of the simulation, and they have avatars or characters inside, and in that case, our bodies are actually our avatars, and we happen to be outside the simulation, plugged in in some way that we are completely immersed within this world. In the RPG version, which is more like a video game, we are here with certain storylines and certain quests and certain challenges that come up along the way. And usually in a video game, the challenges are such that your character has a chance of being able to overcome them, but sometimes you have to play the game more than once. At the beginning of a game, you choose your character, you choose your race, you choose your profession, you choose the basic storyline, and then you choose individual quests along the way. And I believe we all do that in the video game version of the simulation hypothesis. We choose our particular race, we choose our strengths, we choose our weaknesses, and we choose the major challenges. Now, if you had asked me in high school, what I was going to do when I grew up, I would have said, first I'm going to be a software entrepreneur, and then I'm going to be a writer. And turns out that's exactly what happened. Now, how did I know that? I would say it's part of the storyline that I chose, so I just had this sense that was what I was going to do. Now, I was off about the timing. I thought I would become a writer at the age of 28, but it didn't happen until I was 48. And of course, that's when I started to work on this book, The Simulation Hypothesis. In video games, there's a rule in the industry where you want to make the game easy to play, but difficult to master. If the game is too easy and you can master it quickly, you'll lose interest. On the other hand, if it's too difficult, you'll also lose interest and you won't continue to keep playing. And I think the simulation hypothesis gives us the sense that our lives and our world is kind of like that. It's easy to play, we're here, but it's not so easy to master. And that is what I think the challenges that we face in our lives represent in the world of simulation theory. And you can look at different ideas about the world being a place of suffering, but if you remember, in the Matrix, the first version of the Matrix was this ideal world that had no problems. But it turns out that the human mind was not accepting of that. We need challenges in order to keep us going. And so when bad things happen to us in our lives, whether it's financial troubles, relationship troubles, health troubles, other types of things, we can reframe that to think of it in terms of a challenge or an achievement that perhaps a part of us, the player, that sitting outside the game might have chosen for us. And so I find that simulation theory gives us a way to reframe the challenges of our lives. When I started playing video games, they were really simple two-dimensional games. And there was no way we could build an entire 3D MMORPG and a whole world like that contained within Fortnite or World of Warcraft or a game like No Man's Sky, for example, which has 18 quintillion planets. There was no way for the software and the hardware of the time to keep track of all of those pixels on all of those worlds. What's happened since, though, is that we've developed 3D models and we've developed rendering technology that only renders the part of the world that you can see at that moment in time. So my computer only renders the area around where my avatar is, and your computer might render only the area around where your avatar is. So no single computer is rendering the entire world at once. And so when I started to look at the weird mysteries of quantum physics and what they call the observer effect, where there are all these probabilities and there's a probability wave, and then when you observe it or you measure it, that probability wave collapses down to just one possibility. Well, it turns out the rule for quantum mechanics is only render that which is observed, which is exactly the same rule we use in video games to be able to render an extremely complicated world. So that led me to wonder why the world resembles not a material physical world, like those old 2D games we used to play where all the bitmaps and pixels were laid out, but why do we have the observer effect? 
And why does the probability wave collapse to render only one possibility? It turns out that that is very similar to what we do in video games. Only render that which you can observe. And so if the world wasn't really physical, but was built of information that gets rendered for us, then that would make much more sense and provides a unique way to think about the cosmology of the physical universe using video games. Thanks so much for watching. And if you're interested in these topics, you can pick up my book, The Simulation Hypothesis, an MIT computer scientist shows why AI, quantum physics, and Eastern mystics agree we are inside a video game.